Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, tonight's edition of Eversight's webinar series, Cataract Surgery in Fuchs Dystrophy with Dr. Uh, Divya Srikumaran. Uh, just a few quick notes before we begin. Uh, all participants will be muted throughout the webinar to eliminate background noise. Um, you can type questions that you have for Dr. Sriku Maran uh, at any time into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, she will answer those at the conclusion of the webinar. And now I'll just give her a brief introduction. Um, Dr. Divya Sriku Maran is an associate professor of ophthalmology in the Division of Cornea and external disease at Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute. She received her medical degree from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, after which she completed her ophthalmology residency and a cornea fellowship at the Wilmer Eye Institute. Uh, Dr. Sri Kumaran's uh, research interests includes the assessment of corneal transplant outcomes and risk factors for receiving keratoplasty uh, through big data sources, including administrative claims data, uh, she received the Hopkins Center Iris Registry Research Fund Award through the American Academy of Ophthalmology, as well as the EBA Pilot Research Grant to study real-world endothelial keratoplasty outcomes. She's leading a team uh, to integrate Wilmer's clinical data into the Iris Registry and the Source EHR re repository. She's also a renowned educator, currently serving as the Vice Chair of Education and previously the Residency Program Director. As Vice Chair of Education, she has an interest in medical education and studying best practices to support doctors in training, blending her passion for both education and expertise in corneal surgery. Dr. Sri Kumaran has also studied barriers to adoption of advanced keratoplasty procedures by corneal specialists in the US and abroad. And now I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Michael, for the introduction, and thanks for having me. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the webinar. Thanks for listening. So um, as many of you already know, Fuchs corneal dystrophy was first described by Ernst Fuchs, an Austrian ophthalmologist, over 100 years ago in 1910. Uh, he first noted the epithelial bullae that occur in the late stages of this disease and named it dystrophia epithelialis corneae. It wasn't until later that we discovered that the underlying problem here was actually of endothelial dysfunction and uh, the gutae that are seen classically on exam as shown here on the images. Um, it's a hereditary condition with a female predilection and symptoms often begin in middle age. Um, the, this is currently the most common indication for keratoplasty in the United States. So the treatment of sur uh, surgical treatment of Fuchs has evolved over the last 20 years from full thickness grafts to endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, most recently, it's evolved from both from DSEC surgery to DMEC. And in the future, we may see this progress to decimate stripping only or other cell-based therapies. But for the time being, DMEC is the mainstay and standard of care in the United States. So as we can see from the EBA reports in the United States, the number of DMEC procedures have been steadily increasing over the past decade. And in 2021, the number of DMEC and DSEC procedures were nearly the same. So in general, our improved visual acuity outcomes and the lower risk of EK compared to PK surgeries have changed our threshold for offering keratoplasty to patients with boots. And this in turn has resulted in a shift in our approach to cataract surgery in eyes with Fuchs corneal dystrophy. Um, in particular, when considering a patient that has both Fuchs and cataract surgery, it's first and, first and foremost most important to make an accurate diagnosis and to recognize the corneal condition and to counsel the patient on the risk of corneal decompensation or potentially perform a concurrent um, cataract surgery and keratoplasty procedure and to manage the patient's expectations accordingly. So when approaching a patient and when trying to determine whether a combined triple procedure is appropriate, it's first important to distinguish the cause of the visual loss. Is it the cataract or is it the Fuchs? Um, and this can be done through a variety of methods, uh, including, of course, history and, and assessing the patient's symptoms, uh, careful examination, and then diagnostic testing. So in terms of evaluation, a lot of the symptoms of Fuchs and cataract can overlap, including glare, blurry vision. Um, patients with cataract tend to have myopic shifts and they report some change in color perception, but Fuchs patients also will have changes in their color perception, which is more noticeable after surgery. Um, but some symptoms that be more, maybe more characteristics of Fuchs would be morning blurry that clears throughout the day. So patients with milder edema may have edema that's present in the morning, but then as the cornea detrogesses throughout the day, later may have some clearing in their vision. 
And then patients will, with advanced uh, Fuchs may have foreign body sensation or discomfort from the bullet as well. Specular microscopy can be helpful. Uh, it's well known that you need about 500 cells per millimeter square to maintain corneal clarity. And it's well accepted also that cells counts of less than a thousand, especially in a patients with Fuchs, are likely to, to compensate after cataract surgery. However, in patients with Fuchs, it can be difficult to get accurate measurements of endothelial cell counts, and cell counts do not necessarily assess function. Normal specular microscopy, however, can be very reassuring in these patients. Central corneal thickness has also been helpful. Uh, this is a study that was done at the Wilmer Eye Institute um, several years ago and had demonstrated that patients with a central corneal thickness of less than 640 had a much lower odds of receiving penetrating keratoplasty compared to those with a central corneal thickness greater than 640. However, absolute cutoffs do not account for changes in baseline uh, corneal thickness, and it's easy to miss subclinical edema. Uh, the threshold for EK is also much lower than that for PK, as we already mentioned, and so the 640 cutoff may not be entirely relevant for all of our patients. More recently, Dr. Patel from the Mayo Clinic and the Cornea Service there have identified tomographic features that can be very helpful in identifying subclinical edema. Through a series of papers, they've identified three primary features um, on the pentacam here shown. One is the irregular isopax, so patients, um, rather than having concentric rings, have irregular isopax as shown here. Uh, there's nasal displacement here of the thinnest point relative to the center. And then if there's focal depression within the central four millimeters of the cornea, the presence of any of these three features would be indicative of subclinical edema. So this is a case where uh, the use of all three types of diagnostic uh, testing was helpful in addition to the exam in coming up with an accurate diagnosis and plan. So this 83-year-old gentleman was referred for cataract surgery in the setting of Fuchs. He had decreasing vision in his right eye. He had already had a phaco dissect for Fuchs uh, corneal dystrophy in the left eye four years ago at an outside facility. On exam, his vision was 2070 in the right, 2060 in the left. He had very few gutte, however, in the cornea and prominent corneal nerves. The left eye had a clear dissect graft. He had a dense lens. Um, and in the right eye, the pachymetry was elevated 644. The left eye was 757, but again, this is post DSEC. So a pentacam was obtained, and the pentacam actually does not show in the right eye any of the classic tomographic features suggestive of edema. A specular was obtained, and the specular also showed a relatively healthy looking endothelium on the specular in both eyes. Again, the left eye has had a graft. So this raised uh, doubt uh, in addition to the exam of even the diagnosis of Fuchs, if he had it, it was incredibly mild. So we planned to perform just a cataract surgery. He had a history of macular degeneration. So that was also contributing to his decreased vision and no DMAC was performed and the patient has done thankfully quite well. So again, just to highlight the use of all of our diagnostic tools in, in making accurate diagnoses and management plans. So, in patients that have visually significant Fuchs, but no cataract, DMEC alone can be considered, especially for young patients. This series from Dr. Malice's group in the Netherlands compared phagic and pseudophagic eyes that had Fuchs corneal dystrophy and demonstrated both uh, comparable best corrected visual acuity at six months, endothelial cell loss, and re-rubbling rates. Furthermore, they found that the cataract surgery rate was less than 20% at five years. So for young patients with residual accommodative power, a DMEC alone would be preferable. This is the case of mine, 47-year-old patient that I've seen recently. She was referred in actually for post-LASIK ectasia. She had a history of LASIK 23 years ago, and you can see here her manifest refraction, which does show a high, high degree of myopia and some astigmatism. She reports though that her prescription for her glasses has been stable and has not changed much, although lately they have not been helping her. Uh, on exam, uh, we noted four plus gutte in both eyes, and there was also paracentral stromal edema in the left eye. Um, this eye both eyes had a LASIK scar. Her lens was clear. On pentacam, we could see that the left eye does have a high degree of corneal irregular astigmatism and inferior steepening. Both eyes actually had some inferior steepening. But in the left eye, despite uh, this eye being steeper, uh, the corneal thickness was actually greater. Um, there are some changes to the contours with irregular isopax here as well, although it's difficult to interpret the tomographic features in the setting of an eye that has had prior LASIK and possible post-LASIK ectasia. 
However, the edema was present both on clinical exam and again, the pentacam did show some thickening. And so our plan is to do a fake edema and given her age um, and given the irregularity in her cornea, it was felt that it would be better to do a uh, fake edema first and followed by cataract surgery later at a time once her cornea is more stable. So uh, in patients that have both mild Fuchs and a significant cataract, um, careful cataract surgery alone can be considered. But again, it's difficult sometimes to detect subclinical edema or predict which eyes will decompensate. So these patients need good counseling. Um, this is some data from our recent Medicare claims analysis. Um, this is still unpublished, but what we have found is that in over 700,000 beneficiaries with Fuchs, the risk of a first time EK or PK was about 4.5% in the overall population. For patients that specifically had cataract surgery, this Kaplan-Meier curve shows that the rate of endothelial keratoplasty after cataract surgery in the same eye is about 2.4% um, overall over an eight-year time frame. The greatest risk is in the first year. So a large number of eyes with cataracts and foods don't end up requiring keratoplasty. And so when in doubt, I think it's always safer to be conservative and do a cataract alone followed by DMEC later if needed. So this is a patient of mine, 66-year-old female, history of Fuchs corneal dystrophy, and was presenting with blurry vision, um, trouble seeing the computer in small print. She also had a cataract. Uh, her visual acuity is mildly impaired, 20-30 in the right eye, 20-40 in the left eye. She has some gute on exam and a visually significant cataract, slightly thicker pachymetry in the left eye. Um, her specular here shows perhaps slightly in, um, higher cell counts in the left eye compared to the right eye, although this is again a small sample here. Um, and it does confirm the presence of the gute that we saw in exam. And then on Pentacam, we can see that actually in the right eye, she has more features of subclinical edema in the sense that she has the irregular isopax and she has nasal displacement of the thinnest point. In the left eye, she has some mild irregularity to the isopax, but otherwise no other, none of the other features. So our plan for this patient is to just do a FACO alone and DMEC later as needed, even though the left eye has slightly higher pachymetry, given that there are no signs of subclinical edema on her pentagam and the relatively normal looking specula. So when doing cataract surgery alone, there is multiple strategies that one can use to try to minimize endothelial cell loss. And uh, one uh, option is first, of course, to consider cataract surgery in an earlier stage. The less dense the lens is, the less phaco energy that's used and perhaps less endothelial cell loss. Um, one can also consider performing a scleral tunnel incision instead of a clear corneal incision, or to place a suture instead of using stromal hydration to close the wounds. It's also important to carefully remove all of the nuclear fragments to ensure that there is uh, no retained fragments that would contribute to corneal decompensation. For surgeons that are very comfortable performing manual small incision cataract surgery, this may be the preferred option for dense cataracts as this would reduce ultrasound energy. And then the arsenic shop shelf technique has also been advocated as a way to protect the endothelium. And in this case, a dispersive viscoelastic is placed closest to the corneal endothelium with a cohesive or viscoadaptive closer to the lens surface um, for the anterior capsule during the rexus. In general, with respect to IOL selection, I recommend caution when using premium lenses, especially presbyopia correcting lenses for patients in which the gute are going to be uh, left behind. They can impact the visual quality and result in suboptimal outcomes. The patients also tend to have quite a regular astigmatism. Again, if there's any subclinical edema, this can result in irregular astigmatism. And so toric lenses also should be used with great caution. Uh, I tend to recommend aiming for myopia for the possibility of a future EK and also avoid hydrophilic lenses in these cases, again, in the case that the patient may undergo a future EK. Um, this is a study uh, that evaluates the use of femtosecond laser. Um, so this is done by Dr. Ku's group at Bascom Palmer. And what they found is that the risk of corneal decompensation was the same in patients that underwent femtosecond assisted cataract surgery compared to the conventional technique at three months. Another study from Singapore had demonstrated that there was lower endothelial cell loss in eyes that underwent femtosecond assisted laser cataract surgery, um, but there was variable follow-up uh, and the time point for endothelial cell loss was um, different for each patient. 
And so while the results are missed, I think it's ideal for surgeons to use whatever technique they are most comfortable with to try to optimize their outcomes. So finally, patients that have both visually significant flukes and a significant cataract can undergo either combined procedures or stage procedures. And when thinking of combined procedures, the advantages include faster visual recovery, less cost, there's reduced risk of having two procedures in terms of infection and uh, lower cost to both the patient and the healthcare system. Um, some considerations when considering stage procedures are that you could have both first the cataract followed by DMEC or possibly the DMEC first. Cataract followed by DMEC oftentimes may be based on surgeon experience, financial and other logistic considerations or patient preference. And then of course DMEC first could be used to enhance refractive outcomes, but there are risks to the graft, including endothelial cell loss, graft attachment or uh, failure. So this study from the Price Vision Group had evaluated uh, nearly uh, 300 pseudophagic DMIC cases to 200 DMIC triple cases, and they found no difference in postoperative vision and endothelial cell loss or complications at three to six months. Um, so they advocate uh, for combined procedures if the surgeon experience uh, warrants it. Uh, this is a more recent uh, case series uh, from another institution which, in which they found that while best corrected visual acuity and rebubbling rates and rejection rates were comparable, the endothelial cell loss rate at one year was significantly lower in the pseudophagic DMEC group compared to the DMEC triple group. So they, they advocate perhaps for uh, stage procedures. However, uh, the mixed results really here, I think, point to the fact that surgeon preference uh, would be based on surgeon experience and uh, the decision to perform combined versus stage procedures, again, may also be uh, influenced by whether there's any doubt over the need for the DMEC. So anytime that there's any doubt, again, it's better to do a staged cataract first followed by DMEC only if needed, uh, patient preference, and then again, financial considerations for either the ASC uh, in terms of reimbursement for supplies and tissue. So this is a patient of mine in which I did a combined case. It's an 88-year-old female with a history of Fuchs corneal dystrophy and a cataract. She had had phaco desec 15 years ago in her fellow eye, and she now presents with blurry vision that's been worsening over the past couple of years in her left eye. On exam, her visual acuity in the eye that was operated on was already 2060. She had a clear DSEC graft. Her pachymetry is 681. In the eye that she was coming in for, her visual acuity has decreased to 2150. She has four plus butte, a thickened fibrotic DM, a dense lens, and her pachymetry is 651. So a specular was obtained. And in the right eye, you can see um, some endothelial cell loss. This graft, again, is 15 years old, so this is consistent with some loss in attrition over time. And the left eye, uh, that specular actually was a, a very poor quality. It's hard to discern uh, any endothelial cells there. Her pentacam again shows tomographic features of edema. She has a displacement of the thinnest point. She has irregular isopax and then some focal depression here seen um, paracentrally. So our, we did a FACO DMEC. Her visual acuity at four months was, uh, sorry, at six weeks was 2040. The graft is clear, as you can see her on this OCT, and her pachymetry has decreased from 651 to 466 post op. So there's a few pearls when you're doing combined procedures. Um, and one of them is to not place any dilating agents in the irrigating fluid if that's something you typically do, such as amidria or epinephrine. Uh, I recommend making a smaller rexus so that the rexus edge covers the optic edge. It's important in these cases to avoid capsular rupture so that the lens can be placed in the capsular bag. So use tripan if the visibility is low, fake a high out of the bag if you have to. You are going to be doing the DMEC after all. It's more important to not um, have capsular rupture or vitreous loss in terms of your overall ease of the procedure and outcomes. And then when you use a viscoelastic, it's very important to carefully remove all the viscoelastic to re reduce the chance that you would have graft detachments from retaining viscoelastic in the interface. And um, whereas when you're doing cataract surgery alone, a dispersive is recommended. In this case, a cohesive may be preferred. So this is um, one of my early cases and it, uh, just highlight some of these teaching points here. Um, so the rexus is small, uh, and again, a small rexus will improve IOL stability. Um, and what we usually do is place, I usually, initially I was using three-piece lenses for all of my cases. This is a MA50 BM Alcon lens. So it's a hydrophobic lens that has a 6.5 
millimeter optic, which allows for stability of the eye while in the bag. I place my call in the eye to constrict the pupil and then perform a PI intraoperatively. We mark the cornea and it's important to mark the cornea so that you are within your corneal incisions, both the paracentesis and the primary incision so that there's no overlap between your planned graft and um, the corneal incisions. We strip decimates as usual. I do this under viscoelastic and then I carefully remove all of the viscoelastic. Um, and then I do a pull through technique. So this is a graft pull through. Um, and uh, for these cases, I did uh, early on always place a suture as well. Uh, and this just helps uh, to maintain some uh, gas bubble in the eye and to make sure that there's no um, inadvertent pressure on the eye that would then uh, result in a shallow chamber postoperatively. So again, it's important to do a hydrophobic eye well. Consider a three-piece. Um, I've transitioned away from three pieces to doing a single-piece lens, but uh, early on a three-piece can be more stable in the bag. IOL calculations are inherently inaccurate. Oftentimes there's uh, significant changes in the keratometry from the corneal edema. So hyperopic surprises are also common uh, and aim at least minus 0 0.75 to minus one more myopic than your intended target. And again, like the eyes with Fuchs alone that are having cataract surgery, I recommend caution when using premium lenses due to the inaccuracy of the IOL calculations. So this is our review of our Wilmer experience with the refractive accuracy. We compared multiple formulas uh, in postoperative outcomes for patients that had DMEC triple procedures. And we found that with different formulas, the accuracy ranged from a mean error of minus 0 0.10 with the Hagas formula up to plus 0 0.90 with the Barrett formula. So again, I use the Barrett formula. That's my go-to formula for cataract surgery. So I tend to aim somewhere between minus 0 0.75 to minus one. But even with this adjustment, it's very important to counsel patients about their refractive inaccuracy. Because again, this is the mean error, but the spread is much broader. So this case is an example of why that's important. This is another one of my patients that had phaco DMEC. She had pre-op best corrected acuity of 2060. She had stromal edema and glute on exam. You can see again the tomographic features of edema on her pentacam, including the um, irregular isopaths, displacement of the thinnest point, and then the post po focal posterior depression. Her central corneal thickness was 580 pre-op. I had planned, I'd done a phaco DMEC and based on the ILL calculations, I aimed for about minus one, using used the MA50 BN I plant, implanted a 20 diopter lens, post-op month three. Uh, I was expecting with the 20 diopter lens that with the typical shift, I would end up close to Plano. But as you can see here from a refraction three months post-op, she was a minus one. So again, it's important to counsel the patients on the potential for refractive errors um, and the refractive overall refractive inaccuracy with our triple procedures. Um, this is another uh, example of a patient of mine. He's a 72-year-old gentleman that had painful bullying, with pretty advanced and asymmetric Fuchs dystrophy. The left eye had uh, um, 2300 vision on presentation. He had epithelial bullae centrally with four plus gute. His pachymetry was 689 in that left eye compared to 536 on the other eye. We had planned to do a phaco DMEC, but we were unable to obtain reliable keratometry. The lens star couldn't get any measurements. On Pentacam, again, he had the central bullae and central epithelial irregularity. So he had very steep keratometry in the left eye compared to his right eye. Um, I ran the calculations using both the Pentacam keratometry readings and his uh, case from the right eye uh, to do the calculations for his left eye. And there was a four diopter difference in the planned lens. So I ended up using the measurements um, from his right eye for his IOL calculations. And I placed a 14.5 diopter lens. Um, four months post-op, he was 2040 uncorrected. You could see that his pachymetry had improved from over 600 pre-op to 489. And um, thankfully, his refractive outcome was uh, closer to our targets. He was a minus 5.5 and doing quite well. So what are some other options for improving our refractive outcomes? Well, one is to do the stage procedures with the DMEC first. Again, this would result in improved outcome uh, accuracy of our IOL calculations because the cornea is now more stable. It would facilitate placement also of toric and or presbyopic correcting lenses. However, there is a risk of both graft detachment, endothelial cell loss, and graft failure um, with the staged uh, approach with the DMEC first. 
this series from the Price Vision Group evaluated the use of presbyopia correcting lenses and they performed stage procedures again with the DMEC first followed by cataract surgery. And in these 16 eyes, they did get good results in terms of both uncorrected distance and near vision with um, these premium lenses. Another option would be to use the light adjustable lenses, which are more recently available in the United States. Uh, this is a case report with two, uh, two patients with uh, 2015 uncorrected visual acuity in their dominant eye with the light adjustable lens placed during the time of the DMEC triple procedure. So this could be a nice option so that we can do combined surgeries, but still improve our refractive outcomes rather than having to do staged surgeries. So in summary, I just want to um, share, share again that uh, this sort of original algorithm, um, again, the most important first step is to distinguish the cause of vision loss and then to counsel the patients about both options for treatment and all of the possibilities. But that first step is again, most critical. So thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I, I'll ask a quick question while our, um, uh, see if anybody, give, give everyone a chance to, to type in any. Um, you mentioned um, at the beginning of the presentation um, the higher prevalence of fuchs in women. Yes. Um, as well as the uh, age of onset. Um, what is the prevalence of fuchs in the overall population uh, and how does it compare between the sexes? And then are there age-related differences in the onset? Yes, yeah, so thanks Thanks so much for the question. Yeah, so we don't have great recent data on the overall prevalence. Um, sort of going back to some of the Medicare data that I was just quoting, um, we think that, you know, the minimum prevalence is probably around 1%, so it's not that common. Um, and it is probably 1.7 times more common in women than men uh, in terms of the diagnoses. Uh, it is, there's, based on the genetics, you can have both early onset and late onset disease. So when we are looking at Medicare beneficiaries, the reality is we are probably selecting for a, le a later onset disease course compared to patients who've already had keratoplasty earlier on. Um, uh, but there's a lot of variability um, based on the genetics. And uh, so in terms of female predilection, in terms of disease courses and the genetics that are there for both men and women, and perhaps some of the um, factors like estrogen and, and um, sort of um, biologic differences. It's a very nuanced picture that I don't think it's as straightforward as we would like it to be. Um, but uh, it, it's certainly in the United States, um, as we can see, it's, it's far more common in women. And when we look at a lot of our case series that are published, majority of the patients tend to be um, white and they tend to be more women than men in most of our case series, like 60-40 split in terms of patients who are having keratoplasty surgeries. Thank you. Um, I have one more question, I guess if no one's typing typing any in. Um, in the study you cited where they looked at um, endothelial cell loss, um, mm -hmm. I think six months after triple versus um, pseudophagic DMAC, mm -hmm. Um, was there a theory in that paper or do you have a theory as to why the, in my head, like the cataract surgery is done and then you do a DMAC with a constricted pupil like you normally would. Um, do you have a theory as to why they found a higher cell loss in the triple procedures? So I think that that has to do probably with the interoperative manipulation. So when you're doing a triple procedure at the same time, sometimes the lens is more unstable. And, uh, you know, when we are doing our typical technique, the conventional technique for DMEC, you're shallowing the chamber. And so if the IOL is less stable, perhaps there's a little bit more contact between the IOL and the graft, um, or it just takes a little bit more time with manipulation, more time to unfold. And um, that can sometimes, uh, I think contribute to greater endothelial cell loss. So I, I think it's most likely intraoperative manipulation, basically. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we have another question, um, uh, two questions. Um, is there a correlation between uh, Goutte severity uh, and the thickness max? Um, so to my knowledge, there isn't a great correlation between the Goutte severity and the thickness maps. Um, I think a lot of the patients that tend to have more, um, more advanced edema tend to have more significant Goutte, but I don't know that there is a direct correlation. Okay, thank you. And then the second question from um, Dr. Lass is, 
Um, has the advent of uh, DSO uh, changed your approach to the management of patients with cataract and fuchs? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, so I think that there's the role for DSO and these patients is still evolving and still not clear. I think that there is um, some patients that clearly, th there's some patient selection that needs to go into this. And you know the literature suggests that maybe that you need to have patients that have central gluteae that have clear peripheral or per uh, preserved peripheral endothelial cells. But sometimes that can be very challenging to determine um, with examination and with our typical specular microscopy that we have available. Um, and so it can be quite difficult to figure out who is a good candidate for this procedure and who is not. And I think in general, there's a lot of patient um, expectations and their needs. So with patients that are undergoing DSO, the prolonged visual recovery is something that can be quite challenging for a lot of patients. And so it's harder to find both clinically and from a social and patient standpoint, um, the, the right mix here. And for me, I would say that most of my patients, I'm still offering DMEC for the patients that have um, visually significant edema and who are looking forward to having faster visual recovery. Um, and so I haven't found uh, that I'm using DSO very often in my own practice, but I'm looking forward to sort of getting more data on the outcomes longer term, as well as um, better guidance on who really would benefit from this procedure. Great. Thank you so much. There are um, no other questions at the moment. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and close. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, thank you, Dr. Srikumaran, for lending us your knowledge and expertise for the evening. Um, this webinar um, and all of our webinars will be available on our website, eversightvision.org slash webinars. Um, and uh, as an attendee, you'll receive a very brief survey related to the webinar. Please take a moment to let us know what you thought. Uh, thank you to everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.